name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. I am just time warping here until the launch pad is reconditioned so that I can launch my next vehicle. This is the next vessel in the Kegel series. This is the Kegel 4, and like all the other Kegels, this is going to be a crude lander. And it is on its way to the moon. Uh, where I have the Karayim 1 waiting in orbit, docked with asteroid Yoy, and they're going to get down to the moon. Uh, there's a contract there to visit, visit one. Oh, actually, I've got a contract to visit all three of the arches, but I'll only be able to visit one with this particular vehicle, and then we'll have to refuel it and try again for one of the other uh, moon arches. I also have a contract to plant another flag on the moon, so that'll be easy enough. We'll clearly do that, and obviously we'll be shooting for a biome we haven't been to yet. This will be my third crewed landing on the moon, so we'll make sure to land in a biome we haven't been to yet and collect as much science as I can, because one of the things also that this vehicle has is it's crammed full of equipment from the Surface Science Pack mod. Uh, I've used that a bit in and around, uh, actually really just, whoa, oh, <laughs> little bit of a touch there but that's okay anyway yeah I've used the surface science pack in and around the KSC already uh, and you have seen me use it quite a bit there but uh, I want to get it to the moon in fact Kegel 2 was supposed to be the first vessel to do that but I made the mistake of putting all the science stuff in the crude inventory and uh, you can see here this thing is not crewed right now the crew's out there waiting for it and when you don't have crew a crew don't have inventory and none of that science stuff actually got out there so this thing has separate inventory uh lockers that has all the science stuff so we'll get that science stuff so hopefully this will turn into quite the science hall as well also in this episode um we got uh the Korean 3 will be making its way out to uh, or out of Kerbin's sphere of influence, so we'll visit them once they've done that. And I also have another mission to another monolith. I'll try and do that one really quick. I spent a lot of time with that in the last episode. In fact, I'll try and deal with both of those two missions fairly quickly because there's not a lot that's too exciting about them and, and put my energy towards the Kegel 4 here and uh, hopefully get it to the point towards the end of this video where we actually will land on the moon and that means getting through this other stuff a little bit more quickly than normal. Uh, so we got in orbit but once I started to take a look at my lunar injection burn remember that the Korion is in a polar orbit so I have to time this right and it turned out that I just missed uh, my transfer window out to the moon to be able to link up with that orbit. So I had to move forward in time and uh, got it to the point where I created a maneuver that is going to be giving me a trajectory that will be in the same plane as the orbit of the Korion 1. But unfortunately, that burn will be almost three days from now. Uh, yeah, the timing of this probably couldn't have been any worse, but that's okay, because that's going to give us time to see how our crew of the Korion 3 is doing as they head on out of Kerbin's sphere of influence. Okay, we are now orbiting the sun. And this is just going to be very brief, uh, sticking a toe out of Kerbin's sphere of influence and then heading on back after we've collected us some science and gained some experience and also satisfied the requirements of these tourist contracts that I have going. We have three tourists with us. Now there's not a lot of contract or science to get because uh, the Korean one has already done this once so just collecting what I can. Unfortunately the laboratory module is full so I can't even convert that to scientific data. I'll have to wait for another vessel the gravity scan, yep, there we go, that's new. So that's 36 science. One really dopey thing is that I cannot transmit it. Oh yeah, no, no, uh, none of that, that's it. Okay, so we'll transfer Luya, our scientist, out of the lab module into the hitchhiker. Uh, there is no exit out of the lab module. The exits are blocked by the other things that are connected to it. There she is, all right, EVA. 
And she'll go out, obviously, and collect that science. Uh, and as I was saying, I, I can't transmit it, and that was kind of a dopey mistake on my part. I forgot to attach an antenna that can reach outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence. So my antenna doesn't have the range to reach back to Kerbin. Um, yeah, that was kind of dumb. I actually do have an antenna sitting at Kerbin Station that I meant to install on here that would have allowed me to transmit back to science. But I forgot to put it on before I headed these folks off. And by the time I realized it, well, it's not like it's very easy to turn around and go back, is it? So that's that's that but anyway we'll go around and we'll collect the science it's not a big deal um we'll just have to wait until we're back to get the scientific booty that we've collected okay restoring that and the mystery goo there we go yep collect science and restore that one and then all that's left is the gravity scan. And you know, when I send out my DREZ mission, they will have a fresh laboratory module on their vehicle. So they'll be taking the science, recollecting it again, and converting it into scientific data. And then they'll have tons of time on their year out, year journey to DREZ to convert that data to science. So I'm not too concerned that the lab module here is full. We still, though, can store the science that we did collect. There we go. All right, that's it. Luya's job is done. There's my sad dog antenna that can't reach home. Got it open for some reason, even though it's not doing anything. Let's take a look at Luya. Oh, I've been having issues. Every time they're on EVA, the texture goes for their facial expressions goes all weird. Oh, there's Kerbin hanging out there. Oh, we do have a whole stack of messages here. Let's take a look. Okay. Yes, tourist has orbited the sun. Another tourist has orbited the sun. Oh, space station contract. Nice haul from that one. This is a space station orbiting the sun. And another tourist has flown by the sun. But what the difference is between flying by the sun and orbiting the sun, that seems a little confusing to me. Oh, yeah, and I have a VTOL that's done that you probably won't see. <laughs> I built that. Yeah, maybe the less I talk about it, the better. Because if you ever, by chance, maybe might see it, then I'll talk about it. But you probably won't, and it's lame, so the less said about that, the better. Okay, so we will get Chrissy back into the vehicle. Then it's time to get ourselves back home. And I, I started by trying to make a maneuver node. Uh, to sort of set up my return to Kerbin, and that turned out to be, I was very flaky. We're just outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence, so this thing has quite a lot of Delta V on it, so what I decided to do instead was just to target Kerbin and then point straight at it and just burn. <laughs> oh, there's our sphere of influence change. Still over an hour away, so why don't we keep burning and bring that closer. And I'm not sure if this is, in fact, I suspect this isn't the most efficient way to do it, but as I mentioned, I'm pretty good for Delta V. Seems simple enough. I mean, if you just burn straight at them, you got to get there eventually, right? And I think this far away from any gravitational bodies, I think the direct approach probably is the best approach. Okay, a little bit closer. Our periapsis with Kerbin doesn't seem to be moving too much, so I'll have to adjust that afterwards. Once we're in Kerbin's sphere of influence. Oh, it's getting flaky. Okay, wait a second. Okay, that seems to be about 10 minutes away. Tell you what, why don't we time warp, get that out of the way, get ourselves back into Kerbin's sphere of influence, and then we'll fix this trajectory. After a bit of playing around, I ended up with this... Uh, this is only 67 meter per second burn, which got my periapsis into Kerbin's upper atmosphere. I think that looks pretty good, so let's do this. This is definitely a sooner the better type of situation. Okay, we can see our periapsis now coming in towards Kerbin.
Okay. Then uh, let's get rid of the node here. We'll just do the rest of this by eyeball. Close in nice and close. We'll select this periapsis. And it's looking like it's going to be about another 11 days before we're back in Kerbin's atmosphere performing a little bit of arrow braking, which will obviously take a little bit more fine tuning to make sure that arrow braking doesn't become too uh, too spooky. But these folks are clearly on their way back home. So I think this would be a good time for us to get back to the Kegel 4. Alrighty, and we're off. This is the injection burn that I had set up earlier in the video to get me out towards the moon. And then once this burn was taken care of, it was then just a quick time warp. About an hour and a half into the future where I needed to make a small normal correction burn. And you've seen me do these kind of things before. Just the one thing I will point out is do double check to make sure you are going to be meeting your orbit going, your target orbit going in the right direction. <laughs> Last thing you want to do is have to do a 180 degree plane change. Okay, so the Korion is, the Korion 1 is in an orbit of about 50 kilometers. So we just need to push up our periapsis. Oh, just a bit more. There we go. I'll do it. Okay, and we're going to be there in just under a day, which gives us enough time to do another mission. Okay, and we're here with the Otter 4A. And take a look at the altimetry scan here on the zoomed in map on the right here. Look at that nice high res altimetry scan. You got lots of low res gray pixelated from the old scan. The new scan's not quite done yet. And you can see that the mountains there uh, doesn't look encouraging where that waypoint is. So here, we'll bring up the bio map here on the other one, on the big map. There is Badlands over here, a little bit past that waypoint. Yeah, right there, that's what I'm looking at. Um, so if that landing location is completely inappropriate, that's going to be my backup plan, just to go over to those Badlands and uh, see if we can scoop up a little bit more science. I haven't been to the Badlands in a long time. I can definitely do a gravity scan there, maybe a little bit more. Anyway, let's get rid of the uh, maps here, and we'll fly the rest of the way thanks to the headings given to us by the Waypoint Manager. Or oh, I should, I guess, mention uh, spoilers. <laughs> Minor spoiler, I suppose, because we are headed to one of the monoliths, so uh, hopefully people that don't want to be spoiled weren't paying too much attention to that previous map. Specifically, we are heading to TMA3, a contract from... I kept saying last episode the Anomaly Hunter uh, contract pack, but it's actually the Anomaly Surveyor hunt contract pack. I don't know, I like Anomaly Hunter better, but uh, it is what it is, Surveyor. Anyway, and you know, these contracts, I mean, maybe they're a bit tedious, but they certainly are kind of worth it. Like, if you take a look at the contracts plus window, I mean, it's 72,000 curve bucks. That's, that's neither here nor there, but 36 science and 18 reputation is certainly nothing to sneeze at. And I won't spend too much time with this, really. Just just to kind of show you that, uh, well, well, what the consequence of this is, or the consequence, the outcome of this uh, contract is. And Well, part of that is me noticing right around here, you know, is it me or is the sun feeling a little bit low? You know, the light feels a little bit low on the aircraft. Let's spin around here and Take a look at where the sun, oh yeah, the sun is not too far from the horizon. And I know this gave us a pretty view, thanks to Scatter, especially as the sun actually began to set. I do like the way that Scatter actually starts to change the colors through yellow and orange and red as the sun is setting here. It does mean though that uh, this landing is going to be in the dark. Uh, in the mountains in the dark. <laughs> now one thing I could do is I do have the ambient light adjuster mod installed that I do have turned up just a little bit to help with the videos, but I could turn it up to the point where it's almost day and I can see the terrain like perfectly clearly as you can see here, but I don't know, it just feels like cheating. So I think it's better to put it back 
you know, for now and, and see what the situation is when I get there. Now, once I got there, I could actually sort of see. Now, one thing I did see is that, yeah, the waypoint is at the top of the mountain, like the peak. <laughs> but I also noticed that, you know, I can see all right, and, you know, the ground leading up to the peak ain't too bad. Now, I did turn up the ambient light just a little bit, so... Because I always find with the videos, it always seems a little darker than what I see on my computer monitor. So, uh, this is... I'm trying to approximate pretty much what I saw. Though, again, I'm a little bit too cautious. Came in a little bit too slow. So, the result is much the same as what you were seeing in most of my landings in the last video. Once again, everybody did survive, though I kind of, I, I almost went back to the quick save because I looked at that and I said, oh man, I could do this. I just need to practice this a little bit more. These rough terrain landings, this is completely doable. But yeah, you know what? I decided instead, let's let's just get this done. And this time I sent our pilot Svetlana out there, heading towards the monolith, and we get our message. It's really cold here, even in an EVA, EVA suit. Can I go home now? Of course we can go home because we can push the magic button. And even though this was an almost inaccessible peak, magically we are back at the KSC with our contract complete. Now back with the Kegel 4, performing its insertion burn now that it's at the moon, and also setting up its rendezvous with Asteroid Yoi and the Korion 1. And it was only an hour after completing this particular burn that uh, we were closing in on the Karayan 1. Now, I do have a bit of a berthing shortage here uh, around this asteroid. You can see I have two vessels connected to the asteroid. There is the arm B, which is connected via the claw. It's the only one that can connect things that way. And then I do have a docking port on the asteroid that the Karayan 1 is docked with, and that's going to be it. So, the I, I came up with this plan. What I'll do is I will dock the Karayan 1 with the Kegel 4 and then start time warping until we are over one of the arches that I need to land at. And all the while I'll keep it close to the asteroid because once we're ready to land we'll transfer all of our crew minus the tourist. Uh, we actually have five people on the Karayan 1 uh, but the tourist doesn't need to go down to the moon, so the tourist is going to stay aboard the Karayan 1 and be told, like, do not touch anything. <laughs> we'll dock the Karayan 1 back with the asteroid so we'll know where it is. And then we'll bring the Kegel, you know, we'll do the mission with the Kegel. We'll bring it back up. Kegel docks the asteroid, and these folks go home with Karayan 1. All make sense? Yeah, that's sort of the plan. Um, you know, before I got into doing all that, I noticed, you know, there's quite a bit of fuel still left in this transfer stage. That was on the Kegel. So why don't we steal this fuel from here? You know, waste not, want not. And then we'll, uh, we do have some explosives aboard. So we'll end up uh, getting rid of this. Nice. Uh, now it turned out that actually I did not have just a decoupler, but actually a separator between those two stages. So there's another part here floating around, and I really, really, really hate debris. I do happen to have one more set of C4 explosives, so, well, this was a bit of a pain to attach once I got this thing tumbling through my idiocy. And after a bit more fumbling about, Chris Nick was finally able to activate these explosives and then start backing getting himself getting himself out of here. You might also notice if you take a look at Chris Nick's inventory that I uh, took the liberty of liberating some batteries <laughs> from that transfer stage. Uh, you might recall from a few episodes ago that uh, I actually took some batteries from the Karayan and put them onto the Arm B because the Arm B was short on batteries so yeah, then now I can bring the Korion's batteries back up to where they were. And after Chris Nick installed those batteries, got back on board and we started moving the Korion back towards the asteroid, I started scouting out the different uh, waypoints here. Each of these waypoints is one of those, is a lunar arch, which you'll be seeing shortly if you've never seen one before. Again, spoiler, I suppose. And uh, I'm trying to decide which one to go for, and I decided to go for this guy right here. Yeah, it's just on the north of the east crater, and it is 
the first one that's coming up as the moon rotates underneath our orbit. And uh, I do want to kind of get this show on the road. Now, it was after this that I discovered that uh, time warping and trying to keep close to an uh, another object while in orbit was... Oh, wait, 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 what's here? What's this? Time warping is turning off. That's not me. Must be an alarm coming up. Oh! The Kermes command module is complete. That is the next module in my DREZ mission. Awesome. Okay, let's uh, let's roll that out. That's going to take less than three hours to roll out to the launch pad. The launch pad's already reconditioned, so awesome. Uh, yeah, we got a lot going on. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, I was talking about time warping and trying to keep close to that asteroid. Uh, that's not easy. <laughs> I thought I would sort of drift in and back and forth on it. It doesn't work that way. And I was spending quite a bit of fuel just sort of station keeping. And then I finally went, oh, the heck with this. This is not working. So everybody into the lander except for our pilot, Stala. Stala is going to fly the Korion 1 back to the asteroid and dock back with the asteroid. Then she's going to EVA back to the lander. And we're going to get this thing on the road. Honestly, this is what I should have been doing right from the beginning this makes a lot more sense actually what even makes more sense now that i'm watching this i didn't even think about this at the time was i do have a fuel pipe those kas fuel pipe endpoints on the Korion. i could have just c connected using a fuel pipe the uh the lander to the Korion. Actually, for that matter, I'm pretty sure I could have connected it to the asteroid and then i could have kept everybody together without any issues whatsoever but oh well here we go now, you probably noticed me retracting that big solar panel. That solar panel really is there to supply the lab module that is on the Korion. Uh, it takes a lot of electricity to do the laboratory research, but now that there isn't a scientist aboard here anymore, the research is going to be stopping. Or at least that's what I thought, because shortly after retracting that solar panel, I got this message. The only problem is... I didn't notice it. <laughs> I didn't notice when that message gave me the warning. I didn't notice when the message later gave me that the uh, electricity has completely run out. And then all of a sudden I started having trouble docking because the reaction wheels are no longer working. Remember that a lot of this Karine was built using a Kerbal attachment system in space. I was sticking modules on. I was sticking RCS things around. So it isn't, it's pretty far from being balanced. I eyeballed it, but it's, you know, once there weren't reaction wheels holding it steady, it was pretty hard to try and keep it uh, lined up with the docking port. It took me forever to figure this out. Well, forever. It took me a, a you know, I don't know, a minute or so to figure this out. But during that time, well, I burned so much monoprop, and I'd already been burning quite a lot of monoprop just with my station keeping efforts that you were seeing me do earlier. So I ended up burning quite a bit more fuel than I really wanted to. I mean, eventually, I got this under control, and I, we're only at the moon. Should be able to get back without too much issues. That's the idea, is to get back after this, but um, still kind of annoying. Okay, there we go. So, Merlin, don't touch anything while these guys are gone. We'll get Stala out of here, get her back to the Kegel, Then we got our four person crew onto the Kegel. We're ready to get them down to the moon. Yes, no more delays. Time to get this over with. And after a bit more time warping, our trajectory ended up going right over our waypoint. So this is it. We are ready to go. I just got to get myself over to the other side of the moon. We'll start our descent. And you can probably notice here that our trajectory actually is kind of riding the terminator between the night side and the day side. It might be a little dark at our landing spot, but you know, the sun should be coming up soon, so it should be all right, and oh, oh, oh our time warp is uh, dying here. Oh, the uh, Kermes command module is finished rolling out. It's ready for launch. Well, I can't launch that now. That'll have to wait, and it'll be waiting for next episode for sure, because we're getting close to the end of that. I can ignore that for now. We'll deal with this once those folks are on the ground. So you can see, there's our waypoint there towards, yeah, you can see it now at the front. Definitely in the dark, but should be rotating into the light soon. Oh gosh, it's time warp stopping again. 
What do we got? Oh my god! Moho won! SOI change! Okay, I could ignore launching there. I, ca I can't ignore this. Okay, <laughs> I gotta get out there. Okay, jump to ship. Let's see what we have here. Okay, close this alarm. Oh, I want, oh, oh, we got a connection. That's always a good sign. Uh, so let's take a look at what's going on. I always give myself a little bit of lead time. It's not like it should, shouldn't be like right at the SOI. Well, there's the SOI way over there. What's, oh, three hours away. Okay. That makes me feel better. Is there anything I need to do right now? Let's take a look at our trajectory going in. Oh, oh no, that doesn't work. I want a focus view. Oh wait, this is Moho over here. There we go. Focus view. Okay, let's take a look here. Our periapsis is 40 kilometers. I'd like it to be a bit lower. I'd also like the inclination to be a little closer to 90 degrees, but nothing that won't be easier to fix once we're in Moho's SOI. And again, that's three hours from now, so this can safely be put aside for three hours. Obviously, you're going to be seeing this next episode, uh, but right now we got to get back to our landing. All right, so we're starting our descent burn now. Getting our periapsis down. A little lower. Let's get this out of the way. All right, I don't think I'm quite ready to put the periapsis right into the moon. That's good enough for now. And why don't we cut to the final part of this descent because this video is getting long. Okay, just, there we go. That gets my trajectory right over the waypoint. Jeez, my horizontal velocity is like 440 meters per second. I best start really killing this off. <laughs> I waited a little bit too long. Oh my gosh, I am coming up to that spot fast and I am coming close to the ground fast. Oh my goodness. Oh, I did this early on a Sunday morning before I had my coffee and was a little slow on the draw, but I think I just avoided the ground and you can see the arch there over to the right of the screen. And I honestly think I'm slowing down actually pretty well here. There is a drop off. You can barely see. Oh, there you can see it. Uh, right down into the east crater. You definitely do not want to be over that drop off because it falls off pretty quick. But no, come on, stop. Get that pro or retrograde vector up to the top. Excellent. I'm still a few hundred meters above the ground. Oh, I got this. I got this. Oh my gosh, I feel like a, a rock star now. <laughs> that went amazingly. All right, is the final slow down here. Oh, and touch. Touchdown. Whoop, whoop. There we go. We are stopped. And we have no power. Oh dear. So the we are sort of still in the night here. Thing seems kind of lit up, but the uh, solar panels aren't receiving any energy. That's okay. Like I said, the sun should be coming up soon. And I do have... Should be all right. And I do have fuel cells in case of emergency and lots of fuel. Oh, got a message here. You discovered a rock arch on the moon. Yes, we did. And it's a beautiful arch at that. And these folks have a lot of stuff to do, a lot of science to unpack and collect. Not to mention that uh, Moho 1 is now less than three hours away from encountering Moho's sphere of influence, and the next module of my Drez Explorer is just sitting on the pad ready to go. The next episode is going to be a busy one, and I hope to see you then.